The real you is not the physical body. The real you is not the physical body. That's an artifact of perception. That's just an artifact of perception. And we cannot trust the senses, as I said earlier. The senses are not the crucial test of reality. The senses give me the impression that the earth is flat, and I don't believe that. They tell me that the ground I stand on is stationary, and I know it's hurtling through outer space at thousands of miles an hour, etc., etc. So where can I rely on these senses? And yet my entire reality of who I think I am is based on sensory experience. It's a completely superstitious way of looking at the body. The Ayurvedic sages said there's a deeper reality to the body which is much more permanent, which outlasts the physical expression of the body and in fact gives rise to that physical expression of the body. That deeper reality, they divided into several layers of expression. They called it the subtle body and then the causal body. And today we can begin to understand these subtle bodies as what I have chosen to call the quantum mechanical body. According to the latest findings in physics, we have already seen the climactic overthrow of materialism. Anything that we do today in the world of technology, such as using a fax machine or a telephone or a type or a computer or even using a missile to go into outer space, all these technologies, television, radio, etc., are built on the notion that the basic unit of matter is that it is not matter. The basic unit of matter, an atom, is nothing other than particles that are whirling at lightning speeds around huge empty spaces. And these particles aren't material objects, but fluctuations of energy and information in a void of energy and information. So if you could see the human body also the same way, you'd see it's made up of atoms. It is, it is made up of these atoms are particles that are moving at lightning speeds around huge empty spaces. And the particles themselves are not material objects, but fluctuations of energy in an eternal dance of energy. This is the old view of the human body, a frozen anatomical structure. Rather than the body being this, it really is a river of intelligence that's constantly renewing itself. And it is part of a larger void of it that we call the universe. And with this universe, we are constantly exchanging our intelligence. And we do that through certain processes that we call eating, breathing, digestion, metabolism, assimilation, elimination, thought process. If you could see the body as a physicist would see it or explain it, he would say it's made up of atoms and these atoms are particles which are fluctuations of energy constantly appearing and disappearing in an eternal dance of creation. And that eternal dance of creation is who you really are. You can have its experiential knowledge too. There's not a one-time genesis, once upon a time the world began, and not a one-time end, there will come an end, but it's an ongoing genesis of eternal creation. The great physicist Stephen Hawking, that Dr. Curtis was talking about this morning, Stephen Hawking in his introduction to the book A Brief History of Time is quoted as saying, we live in a universe that has no beginning in time, no ending in time, no outer edges in space, and nothing for a creator to do. Now try and conceive of that. Try and visualize it with your eyes closed, and you'll find that it is impossible. It's absolutely impossible. You try and conceive of a universe that has no beginning in time, and the must boggles at the idea of something that never had a beginning. So you say, okay, I'll settle for a beginning, and then the mind again boggles because then the obvious dilemma is, what was there before the beginning? So you say, okay, maybe there's an end, and then of course the mind immediately says, what's there after the end? You say, there are outer edges in space, then the mind immediately says, what's there after the edge? So it's all non-conceptualizable completely. Quantum physics is not only stranger, than we think it is, it's stranger than we can think. <laughs> because it's describing an eternal reality, an eternal continuum without beginning and ending in time. And yet it is responsible for the most successful technology of our time. So 
Ayurvedic seers said that eternal dance of creation from where you come is also without beginning in time, without ending in time, no outer edges in space, and they called it the void of being or the void of consciousness. And they said something very interesting. They said in the Gita one reads, when the description of that void, they say, fire cannot burn it, water cannot wet it, wind cannot dry it, weapons cannot cleave it, because it's ancient and unborn and without, and that's who you really are. So, if we could really experience that, then we would really be freed, in a sense, from the mask of mortality. Once you pierce that mask of mortality, one can have the experiential knowledge of the body, which is proportionately as void as intergalactic space. You see the body as it really is. You see a huge empty void with a few scattered dots and spots and some random discharges here and there. 99.9999% of the body is mostly empty space. And the 0.000001% of it that we perceive as material, it too is empty space. And the question is, what is the nature of this empty space? Is it an emptiness of nothing, or is it a fullness of some non-material intelligence? This is the end of side A. Fast forward your tape until it stops. Turn it over to listen to side B. Today, for the first time in the history of the human race, we have some scientific answers to these questions. About 20 years ago, a scientist by the name of Candice Pert at the NIH, she subsequently became of molecular biology at the National Institute of Health, she discovered in the brain certain chemicals that she called neuropeptides which are the material equivalent of thought. So this was a startling discovery because it showed for the first time in the history of science that every thought, every feeling, every emotion, every desire, every intention, every idea, every notion, every concept has its own molecule. And these molecules, which are literally messengers from inner space, are the molecules with which brain cells communicate with each other. So the way one part of the brain speaks to another part of the brain is not necessarily in the English language with an Indian accent, but in the language of these neuropeptides. These neuropeptides are literally like that fit into locks. So a neuron has on its cell wall these little holes which are receptors and the keys fit into these receptors, and that's how the messages are transmitted. That's how brain cells speak to each other. And it doesn't matter what language you may speak in. You could speak in English or think in English, or in Swahili, or in Burundi, or in Sanskrit. It doesn't matter. The, the notion, the idea, is the identical molecule. Now, what was another startling discovery a few years later by other scientists? is when they started looking at other parts of the body, they found that there were receptors to these messenger molecules in other parts of the body as well. So when they started looking, for example, at cells of the immune system, T cells and B cells and lymphocytes and all these monocytes that normally protect us from cancer and infectious disease and degenerative disorders, they found that the cell walls of the immune cells also had receptors to neuropeptides. In fact, the word neuropeptide became obsolete because neuro implies it's in the brain. 